So Father, right now I ask you, oh God, to speak through me as your humble vessel. Father, I ask, oh God, that even now that I decrease and you increase. Father, I ask that my tongue be like that of the pen of a ready writer to inscribe on the hearts of those who are ready to receive. I pray right now that your word be seed that falls on good soil and may it take root. We come against any hindrance, obstacle, attack of the enemy to try to silence, stop, or impede the word, and we speak life in this place. In the name of Jesus, take all the glory, adoration, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. If you believe it, say amen. If you receive it, shout amen. If you know that it's already done, give God a big shout of hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you. Please come in. You may be Thank you so much, choir. God bless you. So, you know, I, I try to think of a title. You know, I think one of the hardest parts of a sermon is giving a title. Um, and I came up with, we will title this sermon, The Jordan Process. Somebody say, The Jordan Process. Look at your neighbor, say the Jordan process. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. I will read the King James Version. And it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses minister saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all the people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. And every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, had I given unto you as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness of this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Verse 5, there shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not leave, fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto the people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it from the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whatsoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of their mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and they shall have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Tell your neighbor, fear not. Look at your neighbor, say, fear not. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And that shall be a testimony in the house in Jesus' name. So what am I going to attempt to do today? I'm going to go back to the beginning. I'm going to try to dig. Somebody say dig. And let's see what the Lord will have us say. Let's start at the beginning. Verse 1. Now, I, I started to go through this process, and I must confess that I did not get past verse 2. So let's see how far we go. Amen? Now it says this. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Now, while I was reading, the way it works is when I'm, I'm reading, God begins to highlight things to me. And the first thing he highlighted to me in the first sentence was, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Beloved, in case you did not know, servants of the Lord do die. 
Now, it sounds like a very simple statement, but servants of the Lord do die. There is almost this ideology that if we are of God, then we are with God, then we are for God, then death, unless it's in our ripe old age, doesn't happen to servants of the Lord. Can we be real? Can you talk back to me? It says, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. Now, you must understand that Moses wasn't just any other servant of the Lord. This was Moses. The Bible speaks of Moses as the one. He said, God said, listen, I speak to my other prophets in visions and in dreams, but not so my servant Moses. For Moses, I speak to him, what? Face to face. This was a personal relationship. This was Moses who went up to the mountain and spent so much time with the Lord that when he came down, uh, they couldn't look upon him. He wrought so many signs and wonders, and yet it says Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. I'll take it a step further. I'm reminded of another servant of the Lord uh, in, Elisha, in um, 2 Kings verse 13. The Bible speaks of Elisha. Let's go there. 2 Kings 13 verse 14. 2 Kings... Verse 13. Now, read that with me. One, two, go. Now, Elisha was falling sick of his sickness. Where of what? Where of what? Now, this was Elisha who did a double amount of, see, he asked for a double portion. So, Elijah did eight. He did 16 miracles, right? This was Elisha. Who raised the Shunammite's uh, 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 son back to life? This was Elisha. Who struck the Jordan and he split? This was Elisha. But the Bible says that he was sick unto death. In other words, beloved, we don't get to choose the vehicle through which God calls his servants home. Are you with me? He's God, He's sovereign. He decides how, he decides when, he decides what time. Servants of the Lord die. Are you with me? It says, it came to pass, back to Joshua 1, that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Before I go on, Romans 14, 8 says this, and it's very important. It says, so whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. Look at your neighbor, tell them I am the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun. Stay with me. You must understand that for every new season, the Lord speaks. He will not send you where he cannot keep you. For every new dispensation, he's speaking. And I cannot imagine what Joshua must have been feeling like. Moses was Moses. Moses is gone. (laughs) He needed to hear a word from the Lord. Beloved, the Lord is always speaking. Even now he's speaking. And it is our responsibility to tune in. You see, if I told you I was going to be on the radio at 8 o'clock on Rhythm 93.7, I just gave them a free plug. Um, Rhythm 93.7 at 8 o'clock, and if you tuned in to 96.9 Cool FM, would you hear what I had to say? It's not that I wasn't on the radio. It's just that you were tuned to the wrong frequency. Beloved, now more so than ever, we need to be tuned into the frequency of the Spirit to hear what he has to say. It says that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. Now, Moses' minister Minister jumped out to me because when you see Moses' minister, he wasn't just any minister. He was Moses' minister. He was Moses' servant. Now, let us in no way try to diminish who Joshua was. Joshua was the one who fought the Amalekites when Moses held his hand up. 
as long as his hand was held up, Joshua and the children of Israel were winning. Joshua was one of the spies who went in to spy out the promised land. And of the ten, only two came back, one being Joshua, who gave a good report. Joshua was, one of the, was the one who would go with Moses when he went up to the mountain, stayed at the base. And most importantly, Joshua was the one that Moses laid his hands on in Deuteronomy 34, right before he passed. He was the one who received the mantle. Now, the next question I asked myself is, what is a mantle? Now, I will let you know that I describe the mantle as simply the portion of the anointing that comes on an individual to function in purpose. Some of you might ask, why do you say portion? Uh, because it's tangible. How do I know it's tangible? Because Elisha asked for a double portion. Are you with me? He, it's the, simply the portion of the anointing that comes on an individual to function in purpose. Now, where do mantles come from? 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Let's put it on the screen. 1 Corinthians 4 to 11. Now, I want to read. It says this. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. Continue. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God which worketh in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to what? For one is giving the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Continue on. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. Continue on. But all these work at that one and the self same Spirit, Divide into every man severally as he wills. Now, here's what you must understand about mantles. Mantles are never destroyed or taken with the host when they die. It is simply transferred. Moses transferred his mantle to Joshua. Elisha transferred his mantle. He was about to cross the river. It was a very interesting thing. Elijah's about to be taken up, and he tells Elisha, please stay here, suffer thee, while I'm going to Jordan. And Elisha says, as surely as the Lord lives, wherever you go, I shall go. And they get to the river Jordan. I'm preempting myself, but let's go with it. They get to the river Jordan, and he says, suffer thee, stay here while I cross. And the prophets seem to tell Elisha, oh, by the way, did you know that the Lord will take your master today? And he says, what business does it? This is Pastor Jay's version, so don't quote me verbatim. What's your business? Mind your business. I did not ask you. And he follows Elijah. Now they get to the Jordan and Elijah takes his mantle, strikes the Jordan, and they pass through. And the Bible says that when it was about to be taken up, Elisha says, my father, my father, the father, the chariots of heaven. And he says, Elijah says to him, what shall I do for thee? He says he wants a double portion. And as it was taken up, the mantle fell down. Because Elijah said to him, if you see me go, then you get it. Now, before they crossed the Jordan, Elijah was the initiator. Elisha was the beneficiary. When the mantle was transferred, physically, on the outside, everything looked the same. But on the inside, something had changed. Because Elisha would go back to the same Jordan. And where he crossed as, an, as a beneficiary, 
Now he steps into the shoes of the initiator. And he holds on to the mantle and he says, God of Elijah, where is the God of Elijah? And he takes the same mantle and he strikes the Jordan. And the Jordan parts. There was a transfer from Elijah to Elisha. Now, remember I said mantles are never destroyed. They are simply, are you still with me? Stay with me, we're going somewhere. Elisha, the Bible talks about Second Kings, that he was sick unto death. And so if we're going by the pattern, before you go, you transfer. The next to receive this mantle, as far as Elisha was concerned, was Gehazi. How many people remember Gehazi? But Gehazi disqualified himself when Naaman came because it was after money. Remember the story? And so when it was time for Elisha to go, there was no one to transfer the mantle to. How do I know this? Because the Bible records that when Elisha died, and he was buried in the tomb, there was a problem. They were carrying a dead man, and by mistake, <laughs> they happened to drop the dead man in the tomb of the bones of Elisha. And what happens? As the dead man entered the tomb, the dead man jumped up. <laughs> you know why? Because the mantle still rested on the bones of Elisha. Mantles are never destroyed. They are transferred. Beloved, can I tell you what I did when the general was about to go home? You know what I did? I took his hand and I put it on my head. And I said, pray for me. Because I knew that he must die empty. <laughs> and this mantle that is carried cannot waste. So I put my knees on the ground. And I put his hand on my head. And he prayed for me. And although on the outside, it looks like nothing has changed. Oh, but on the inside. Mantles are never destroyed. They are simply. Now, write this down. You cannot receive a mantle that you don't serve. You see, everybody wants the mantle, but no one wants to serve. Joshua was a minister of Moses. Elisha had his own life. He was in the field of his parents. And Elijah just walks up, says nothing to him, puts his cloak on him and walks away. Not a conversation. Nothing was discussed. And all of a sudden, Elijah is like, Ooh, okay. He runs after him and says, sir, please wait. Let me say bye to my parents. Because he knew that the life that he lived before was over. Elijah says, what business do I have with you? I'm just... No one told him. He went, killed the oxen, gave it to them. And from that moment on, everywhere Elijah went, you saw Elisha. You cannot receive a mantle that you don't serve. Are you with me? Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. It says... He spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Can you read the next word after that? Oh, come on, read it with me. Say it loud. You got to say it like you believe it. Say it now. Somebody say now. He says, now. Therefore, Arise. Now, now, let's not rush. Let's sit on now. When you hear the word now, I get excited. Because now 
definition of now is at this present time or moment. But you see, this now was a very pregnant now. This now had been simmering for over 400 years. This now began over 400 years ago in a conversation between a man and his God. This now was a covenant that God made with Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 18. Put it up on the screen. Genesis 15, 18. It says this. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, continue on. The Kenites and the Kesanites and the Kadomites, the, the Kadomites and the Hittites and the all the ites and all the ites. And all the ites, go where all of them, you get it. Jebusites, all the ites, all the ites, good. But the point is, God says to him, you see, it was, you see God is very specific. He's telling him, I am going to give your children, your descendants, all this land. See, this now that we're speaking of was a fulfillment of promise. Write this down. Sometimes God takes a long time to act suddenly. Sometimes. God takes a long time to act suddenly. You see, Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says this, the Lord who is faithful and keeps his covenant to a what? Thousand generations. Now, let's stay, let's stay at Abraham for a bit. God is talking to Abraham and he says this, your descendants will be afflicted. Now, God is speaking to a man who does not have a child. Well, he had Ishmael, but that was not the covenant child. He said one will come from Sarah. He says, just so you know, your descendants will be slaves for 400 years. And then after which I shall bring them out into a land that I will give them. Can we just stop for a second? And let's analyze that statement. In other words, God was speaking to Abraham in his now, but he was already 400 years into the future. Wait. God was speaking to Abraham in his now, but he was already 400 years into the future. The one who knows the end from the beginning. Beloved, why are you worried about tomorrow? You may not know what holds, you may not hold tomorrow, but you hold the one who holds tomorrow. We don't have to know what tomorrow brings. Understand that when God deals with us, I've said this before, he doesn't deal with us situationally. He deals with us generationally. He's talking to, Mo, to, to, to Abraham in his now, but he's telling him about what will happen 400 years into the future. Beloved, don't worry about what you shall eat or drink. Which one of you can add a hair to your life? The God we serve does not sleep, does not slumber. He knows the end from the beginning. So therefore, in other words, it begs to reason that when God is dealing with us, a lot of times when he's doing things, it's not just about our now, but it's about our tomorrow. With the same logic, which means that whenever the devil is fighting you, he's not fighting you for your now. Not where you are now, but where you will be tomorrow. How do I know this? The devil is trying to abort the plan 
and says, you know what, there cannot be a deliverer. So he tells Pharaoh, puts it in his mind, hey, okay, every, it tells the midwives, if any of the Hebrews have a male child, what do you do? <laughs> because if I can abort the promise, then the promise cannot come through. Because Moses had to deliver the children of Israel, so let's kill all the babies. When Jesus would come, what does Herod do? Every male child, what does he do? See, the devil doesn't fight you for your now. He fights you for your... And it is very important, I've said this before, to surround yourself with people who do not just see you for your now, but see you for your... You see, when the kings came to Jesus, they did not bring gifts for a baby. The wise men did not bring gifts. They didn't bring pampas and milk <laughs> and serilac. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought gifts for a king. They were not giving to a baby. They were giving to a king. Beloved, I don't know what the struggles and the fights that you are going through, but uh, let me quickly encourage you. I'm looking at my time with Joseph. Joseph was a prince in his house, and then he was thrown into a pit. And you know the story, sold as a slave. And for 12 years, he rose to the top of Potiphar's house. And then he got to the top finally and he said that the Lord blessed Potiphar because of the house, blessed the house of Potiphar because of Joseph. And he, he has tried, you sold like a slave, by your brothers, by the way, by your family, the worst type of betrayal, your, your own blood, flesh and blood. And then you're minding your business, trying to honor the Lord, wife of Potiphar. I rebuke every wife of Potiphar in Jesus' name. Just following the Lord and trying to, she came. And you know, a lot of times, I don't think we give Joseph a lot of credit because it was almost virtually an impossible situation. She says, sleep with me, or I say that you raped me. Now you must understand that the Israelites back then were second class citizens and it was instant death. So she was saying, if you do not sleep with me, either way you will die. And he chose to honor the Lord. And we know the story, he threw him in prison. He was there for another two years. He became the head of the prison. He was prison all the same. But finally we know he ended up in the palace. And then when he would finally see his brothers, we know how the story goes because of time, he says, Fear not, because what you meant for evil, God has turned it around for good. Beloved, I don't know what you're going through, because no matter how slick the devil thinks he is, power past power. <laughs> and no matter how intelligent <laughs> he thinks he is, God always has an ace up his sleeve. When Elijah thought he was by himself, the Bible says, God says to Elijah, what are you crying for? I have 7,000 prophets reserved that have not bowed the knee. Beloved, all things work together for all things, not some things. All things, not good things. Somebody say, all things. All things work together for, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He's speaking to Abraham. He says, your descendants will be slaves for 400 years. I was reading this and the Lord gave me a word, Ezekiel 12, 28. I'm going to read it real quick. It says, therefore say to them, this is what the Lord, the sovereign Lord says. None of my words will be delayed any longer. Listen, I'm speaking prophetically right now. We're talking to your now. Somebody say now. 
He said to say to you, none of my words will be delayed any longer. Whatever I say will be fulfilled, declares the sovereign Lord. Now my servant is dead. He now says, therefore, arise. Somebody say arise. Somebody say arise. Somebody say arise. I don't know what that situation is, but I say to you, beloved, I don't know what the circumstance is saying, but I say to you, church, I don't know what the bank account is saying, but I say to you, I know the economy is not smiling right now, but I say to you, you may not see the wind. You may not see the rain, but our valleys shall be filled. I don't know how it's going to happen. It's not my job to know how. The Bible says, Elijah said there shall be no rain. And there was no rain for three years. Then he says, he goes to pray, and uh, I remember uh, while, while we were away, uh, I was watching, well, Daddy and I were watching one of his sermons, and was talking about how Elijah prayed, and he was saying he thought to himself, how did Elijah pray? And he got on his knees, do you remember? And he put his hand between his head. He said, I got it, and he said to do that. <laughs> he said he prayed, and he told, go, go and check. Because I hear the abundance of rain. The ground was dry. It had not rained in three years. But church, open your ears. Can you hear the abundance of rain? The Bible says, he said, I hear the abundance of rain. And what's interesting about that, he says, and it rained, and one of the things that we miss in that, he says, and the crops grew. For crops to grow, there was seed in the ground. In other words, there were people that were sowing seeds even though it was not raining. You see, if you want to sow seeds after the rain comes, then you are already late. Because we do not operate by the economy of the world. Because when they say there is a casting down, then we will say. So there were people that were sowing in the ground even though it was not raining. And when the rains came, the crops grew. Church, look at your neighbor and say, arise. I want to show you something. Go to Genesis 13, 14, verse 17. Are you still with me? We're going somewhere. Like I said, I didn't get past Joshua 1, verse 2. But the Lord will help us. Amen? Genesis 13, 14 to 17. When I looked at the word arise, there is a principle when it comes to studying the word, and it talks about the law of first mention. It's one of my favorite ways to study the scripture. And he says... Every, the first time a word is mentioned, it gives you a good idea about what the significance of the word means. So I wanted to check this. So Genesis 13, let's put it on the board, verse 14 to 17. This is the first time you hear the word arise. It says, and the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it to thy seed forever. And I will make their seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth... Then all thy seeds shall be numbered. Now look at that word in verse 17. What does it say? Arise. 
walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it for I will give unto thee to claim what to, I will give it unto thee. In other words, I wrote this down. To claim what you see, you have to arise. God showed it to him. This is what I will give you. Look north, look south, look east, look west. But then arise and walk. To claim what you see, you have to arise. I'm reminded of John 5 when Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda. And he spoke to the man by the pool for 38 years. And he asked him a question. He said, do you want to be healed? And he says, sir, every time I look at the pool, when I try to get there, somebody else gets in front of it. And you know what Jesus says to him? Arise. Take your bed and walk. Beloved, you have seen it. Now it's time to claim it. Somebody say, arise. Somebody say, arise. Somebody say, arise. One of my dad's favorite scriptures is Isaiah 60, arise. Shine. For your light has come. It says, arise, going back to Joshua 1, and go over this Jordan. Now, let's look at the word Jordan. It says, arise and go over this Jordan. Somebody say this Jordan. Let's look at the law of first mention again. Genesis 13, verse 10. Jordan, I wanted to understand the significance of the Jordan. The significance of the Jordan. Law of first mention. Genesis 13, verse 10. It says this, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zohar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the... And Lot journeyed eastward. The Bible says then they separated from... Somebody say separated. Somebody say separated. The two things that surround the word Jordan, looking at the law first mentioned, the Lord began to show me that Lot represents the flesh because he chose after the flesh. And Abraham represents the spirit. And the second thing is that there was a separation. So the Jordan is a separation between the flesh and the... Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Now... When I, when I make certain statements, I like to back it up with scripture. And I began to check, to test this theory, to see other times the Jordan appeared in the Bible and this was true. Now, if you think about the fact that the children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years and they were separated by the Jordan and he separated the wilderness from the promised land. The Bible talks about in Numbers how they ended up staying 40 years. Do you remember? They began to grumble. And they said, is it not better that we have died in Egypt or died by the sword rather than bring us to the wilderness? And God said, you know what? As you have said it, you will have it. For every year, that, for every day that you are in the promised land where you spied for 40 days, I give you a year. So instead of staying in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 years. It says everyone under 20, everyone over 20 will not see the promised land. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 13, for if we live after the flesh, you shall, but if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall, for as many are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So there again you see wilderness, living by the flesh, promised land, living by the spirit, separation, the river Jordan. Another time, Elijah and Elisha in 2 Kings, when they will cross the Jordan like I spoke about today. Crossing the Jordan was significant for Elijah. You know why? Because he was shelving his earthly body for his spiritual body. He was going to leave the flesh before he went to Jordan. When he crossed over to the Jordan, translate into the spirit. For Elisha, he was going to live a life of flesh and take on the mantle where he will walk with the spirit forever. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53, for the corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must pass on to immortality. So therefore, Elijah put on the put on the incorruptible. So again, the separation between the incorruptible and the corruptible was what? The Jordan. Are you with me? Stay with me. Again, we look at the Bible with Elisha and Naaman. In 2 Kings 5 verse 14, Elisha asked Naaman to go dip in the Jordan. How many times? How many times? Seven times. Now you must understand when you look at biblical numerology that seven is the number of completion. It is the number of perfection. Seven is the number of the spirit. God created the world in six days and on the seventh day it says God rested. In Deuteronomy 15 verse 12, it says that for every seventh year, the Israelites are to cancel all their debts that they have made and free all the slaves. In Leviticus 16 verse 14, the Bible speaks about how this blood was sprinkled how many times? Seven times on the mercy seat, thereby making atonement, making it the day of atonement. Jesus replied to Peter, how many times are we supposed to forgive? Seven times, 70 times. Now, when you go through the book of Revelation, there are seven trumpets, there are seven seals, there are seven churches, there are seven angels, there are seven letters, there are seven churches, there are seven bowls, seven stars, seven priests, seven thunders, seven golden lampstands, seven last plagues. The number of the Spirit is... Are you with me? So when he tells Naaman to dip into the Jordan seven times, it was flesh to spirit. Another time you look at Jesus and John the Baptist, the Bible says that when Jesus would come to get baptized, John says, suffer it not be so. I mean, Jesus said, suffer it not be so. John said, suffer it not be so. I shouldn't be the one being baptized by you. But he said, let it be so that the scripture is fulfilled. And the Bible says that Jesus, he went into the Jordan. He went in as the son of man and came out as the son of, son of the Spirit came upon him. We know the story. He came as a dove, say, this is my beloved son. Hear he him. So in other words, there is a separation between the flesh and the Spirit. To enter into the Jordan, you must pass through from the flesh to the... Are you with me? And the only thing that can transform us from our carnal nature to this spirit-filled life is the power of the cross. I'm going to say the power of the cross. Now, when I say the power of the cross, I'm not talking about the objective side of the cross. I'm talking about the subjective side of the cross. Pastor, what do you mean by objective side of the cross versus subjective side of the cross? I'll show you what I mean. First Peter 3, 18, stay with me. I'm going to go really quickly. It says, for Christ also suffered for once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the, in the, but being made alive in the, it's talking about what Christ did. That is the objective side. We know what the cross represents. It was the redemption. Now let's look at the subjective side. First Peter 4, 1, 3, he says this, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, are you with me? Because Christ suffered in the flesh, Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from. So as to live the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of, for the will of God. How do we do this? Galatians 2.20, we know what it says. It says this, I am crucified with Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with... I am crucified with... 
That's the subjective side of the cross. It's not enough to know what the cross represents, but now you have to interact with it. And when Paul is saying, I am crucified, he's saying, I identify with Christ. I identify with the crucifixion of the cross. I identify with the suffering. Oh, that's something we don't like to talk about. It just got really quiet in church. <laughs> Hebrews 5.8 Though he was a son, stay with me, I'm going to go very quick. Hebrews 5, 8. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he, he learned obedience through the things that he, he suffered. He suffered. Romans 8, 16 to 18. It's this the spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God look at verse 17 it says this and if we are children then we are what and if we are heirs of God then we are joint heirs with if so be that we suffer with that we may also be glorified you see we want the glory but we don't want the suffering oh it got really quiet in church We want the glory, but we don't want the suffering. Look at verse 18. He says this. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time, read it with me, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. James 1 verses 2 to 4. He says, my brethren, count it all. Count it all. When you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that this, that the trying of your faith, it worketh what? It worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, and entire wanting what? I'm throwing all of things at you and I'm going very quickly. But you know what? I'm talking about suffering. And we're going to talk about that at a different time. But one of my favorite scriptures, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says this. Come unto me, although ye labor and are heavy laden. Now what shall I do? What shall I do? Now listen, listen really quickly. You see, the star of that scripture, a lot of times we look at the yoke and we look at the burden. But you know, to understand it, I think the star of that scripture, when you talk about yokes and burdens, is the animal the yoke is put on. Pastor, what do I mean? You cannot put a 100 pound yoke on a 20 pound animal. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you put a 100 pound yoke on a 20 pound animal, what will happen? It will weigh it down. You only put a hundred pound yoke on an animal that has not only the capacity to hold it, but to move with it. Right? When he says, come on to me because my burden is easy and my yoke is light. In other words, I will not put on you what you don't have the capacity not only to hold, but to move with. Somebody missed what I'm saying. He will not put on you more than you can handle or Bear. Job said, I will come out when he has tested me. I will come out as pure gold. Back to Galatians 2.20 because of time. He says this, and the life that I live now, I live by, somebody say faith. Somebody say faith. Somebody say faith. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, we live by and not by why do we need to live by faith and not by sight? Because, beloved, when we cross into the promised land, Jericho is waiting. When we cross into the promised land, Jericho is waiting. Now, Ephesians 6 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 16 says, above all, take the shield of, take the shield of, where we should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Understand this, where we go into the promised land, we are not going as conquerors, we are going 
as heirs. And there is a difference. You see, conquerors have to go and fight. Heirs just simply walk into their inheritance. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So it is important as we journey, as we cross the process of the Jordan, we must now begin to walk by the Spirit. Those who are led by the Spirit are the sons and daughters of you need the spirit in the promised land. Because if you go by your flesh, you look at the walls of Jericho and come back with the wrong report. The Bible says, hear me, in this, in this season, you will not have to fight battles. You, all you will have to do is stand still and see. Listen, listen, remember. God is speaking. We are living by the Spirit because it is in Him that we live. It is in Him that we move. It is in Him that we have our being. Beloved, now is the time to step into the promised land. Now is the time to live by the Spirit. In everything that we do, we crucify the flesh. In everything that we do, we, 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 we join ourselves to Christ on the cross, crucifying our flesh made alive in the spirit. In everything that we do, we seek the Holy Spirit. Last thing I'll say before I end, David was a man of war. His hands were fashioned for war. He was made for war. He took broken, dejected men that were depressed and he made them mighty men of valor. They speak about the men of Moses. One could kill 300 men with a throw of the javelin. He was a bad man by any, by any kind of uh, uh, um, standard. The Bible says that he fashioned his hand. He taught him how to make war. He was a war machine. But every time before he would go out, he would seek the Lord. Shall I pursue? Shall I? If you don't send me, I don't want to go. If you don't lead me, I don't want to go. If you don't speak to me, I don't want to go. Anything that is not from God, I'm not interested. Because see, the blessings of the Lord make it rich and adds no. If you don't lead me, I don't want to go. If you shut the door, I don't want to walk through it. If you open it, then I'll go through it. If you tell me stop, I'll stop. If you tell me stay, I'll stay. If you tell me sit, I'll sit. Although everybody might be running to the land, he says to Isaac, stay in this land. Wherever you say to go, because where he sends you, he'll sustain you. In this season, we live, we move by the spirit bow our heads dear heavenly father we thank you we thank you that it is in you that we live it is in you that we move it is in you that we have our being in this season as we are about to cross over into the promised land as we interact with the cross as we bear in mind that we are now co-heirs that we will suffer with you so we will be glorified with you we kill our flesh we die to the flesh so that we'll be alive with you by the spirit direct us instruct us be a cloud of 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 pillar by uh, a cloud uh, a presence of the cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night where you lead we shall follow Seek thee more dearly, hear you more clearly, follow you more nearly, day by day. 